The history of orphans stretches back before written records. It's reasonable to guess that in the early days of human civilization, orphans were commonplace. The pressures that unwanted and unhealthy children might place on a tribe forced parents to sometimes get rid of their children, either through abandonment or infanticide. But hey, we're not the only ones. Wildebeest only have five minutes to get moving. To start things off, I'm going to look at the story of Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome. The two boys are heirs to the throne, but when their great uncle takes over, he orders a servant to kill them. However, the servant takes pity on the two boys, places them in a basket, and sends them down river, where they are nursed by a she-wolf. I like the way the she-wolf looks at the camera. She looks like a character in the last panel of any Wizard of Id comic strip. Eventually, they are discovered by a shepherd and his wife, who raise the two children as their own. In time, they return home, kill their great uncle, and regain their place in the monarchy. This theme has been repeated countless times, and remains prevalent even today. Paris is also supposed to be killed by a royal servant, but instead he is abandoned and nursed by a she-bear. Oedipus Rex is the same story. He is supposed to be killed by a royal servant, but instead he is given away and raised by peasants. But there's no she-bear or she-wolf or anything. There's nothing special about Oedipus. Abandoning children was an accepted practice in the ancient world. Even great thinkers like Aristotle condoned it. As to exposing or rearing the children born, let there be a law that no deformed child shall be reared. I hate the movie 300, but it does show the gritty reality of infanticide. When the boy was born, like old Spartans, he was inspected. If he'd been small or puny, or sickly or misshapen, he would have been discarded. It's interesting to note that the Greeks and the Romans protested child sacrifice quite strongly. Plutarch noted that some women actually sold their children to be sacrificed. However, if they shed one tear, the payment would be forfeit. I find this attitude surprising, given that many major Greek and Roman gods cannibalistically ate their own children. A famous example is the birth of Athena. Zeus eats her pregnant mother, but the goddess is born inside of him. She bursts out of his skull wearing full armor. The Jews have historically had low rates of infant mortality. This might have something to do with the story of the prominent figure Moses. Moses' parents are forced to abandon him, so they put him in a basket and send him down river. Unlike Greek and Roman stories, he's adopted by royalty, not peasants. But when he reconnects with his tribe, he becomes the major leader. The father of the monotheistic religions, Abraham, is also worth mentioning. When his wife Sarah is unable to conceive an heir, he impregnates his servant girl Hagar, who gives birth to Ishmael. A problem arises when Sarah miraculously gives birth to Isaac. Abraham banishes the servant Hagar, as well as his son Ishmael, who would become the ancestor of Muhammad, the founder of Islam. Not only is Abraham guilty of abandonment, in one of the most baffling chapters of the Bible, God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. Abraham agrees and prepares to kill his son in order to prove his faith when an angel stops him. Muhammad's life is better chronicled than other religious figures. He is yet another orphan who is raised in humble origins and becomes a great leader. But the last religious figure I will mention is Jesus, and this is only my interpretation. Just like Romulus, Moses, Muhammad, and other major figures, he is raised in humble origins and becomes a great leader. Although he has two parents, his real father, as he claims, is God. The completed sacrifice of Jesus by God parallels the incomplete sacrifice of Isaac by Abraham. His last words as a mortal are, Father, Father, why have you abandoned me? As you can see, the problems of abandonment and infanticide in the ancient world became frequent subjects of discussion in the stories of the day. It wasn't until the 4th century that abandonment and infanticide became discouraged in the Roman Empire. However, with the approach of the Dark Ages, fewer and fewer written documents were taken. So today it is difficult to establish what the realities facing unwanted children were at the time. We do know that the church played an ever-increasing role in the lives of parentless children. Naturally, the church discouraged infanticide as a sin, so they often took in abandoned children, who would later become monks, nuns, or given to other parents of the community. To decrease the risk of parents killing illegitimate children, many institutions implemented the foundling wheel, which allowed mothers to donate anonymously. Many countries, such as Germany, have recently reinstituted this technology. At this hospital in Berlin, there's one of four baby hatches dotted around the city. 
When the signal sounds, hospital staff move into action. This is the inside of the baby hutch. It's warm in here. Uh, this is a normal uh, bed for a newborn. See the camera here, which again watches the scenery here only, and not the uh, area in front of the baby hutch. Another religious institution which helped orphans was that of the godparent. Because of the high adult mortality rate, a godparent would look after the child in the event of their parent's death. This idea carries over into the theme of fairy godparents, such as seen here with Cinderella, but more on that later. Many of the orphan stories of the Middle Ages parallel those of the ancient world. Havelock is heir to the Danish throne, but when his parents die, the nobleman Godard tells a servant to get rid of the young boy. The servant screws it up, of course, and Havelock is raised as a peasant. He starts glowing for some reason, and he comes home, kills Godard, and becomes king. Shakespeare stirred things up a little bit with a winter's tale. The king Leontes suspects that his pregnant wife Hermione has committed adultery, so he puts her in prison. Hermione dies giving birth to Perdita. Leontes is still pretty messed up, so he tells his servant Antigonus to abandon the child. The servant takes pity on Perdita and is about to give her away to a good family when he is attacked by a bear. That's right, a bear! <laughs> Anyway, she's raised by shepherds, this guy sells ribbons and stuff, I don't know who cares, and she eventually becomes a princess again, and it's a happy ending. Uh, it's more complicated than that, it's Shakespeare, but not right now. One final royal orphan from the Middle Ages is King Arthur. There are many versions of the Arthur story, but most sources agree that Uther Pendragon is Arthur's father. Uther is killed by a Saxon warlord, and Merlin takes Arthur away to be raised as a lowly squire. When he pulls the sword from the stone, he becomes king, and after a while, he kills the Saxons responsible for his father's death. So what was going on that would make the story repeat so many times? I did some research, and I guess a lot of people died in the Middle Ages. Like there was knives and, and poison and, and stuff, and like a lot of people died, it was crazy. Many nobles killed each other in order to become monarchs. This guy here, Machiavelli, said, that if you're going to stage a coup, you should kill the person's entire family, or else their kids will come after you. And he's right, the stories in the literature reflect that. In real life, royal orphans weren't saved by incompetent or empathetic servants. They were the result of a harsh and turbulent political reality. Henry VIII executed Anne Boleyn because she was unable to produce a male heir. In this scene, which is reminiscent of the last scene in Braveheart, we see Anne Boleyn being beheaded. Oh, Hollywood, you love martyrs so much. Getting your head chopped off back then really sucked because it meant your body wouldn't be resurrected when Jesus came back. I digress. Anne's daughter became an orphan, but she would later become one of the most influential female leaders in all of history. Elizabeth I, or Queenie, had a difficult childhood and was almost killed because she was a successor to the throne. But, as providence would have it, she became Queen of England and had one of the most illustrious and longest careers in English history. Among her accomplishments, she oversaw diplomatic talks with another orphan monarch, Ivan the Terrible. In a Soviet film biography about Ivan's life by Sergei Eisenstein, we see Ivan's mother killed in front of his eyes. Uh, is really... This event was partly responsible for Ivan's paranoia throughout life. Just a quick side note, the music in these films was done by the famous Russian composer Sergei Prokofiev, who died on the same day as another Russian figure. Ivan always held a grudge against the nobility who killed his mother, and he made efforts to seriously limit their freedoms. Ironically, Ivan's rage caused him to kill his own son, just three years before his own death. 